Are you ready, Professor? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Park, for the invitation, and thank you so much for the introduction. I'd like to welcome all the attendees, and I hope this uh, lecture is going to be uh, useful. Uh, so now uh, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Yes. And I hope my voice is clear. And uh, here we are. So maxillary skeletal expansion using MARPI or, or MARP. Some people call it MARPI, some people call it MARP. I don't know exactly what's the right way to pronounce it since it's a made up word anyway. So I'd rather call it MARP. Now MARP usually stands for mini screw assisted rapid parietal expansion. And uh, what that means is just uh, our uh, rapid parietal expander, the Hyrax, now has got uh, a booster and now it has uh, implants. And this is basically the same. This is the idea of the lecture. If you're new to it, this is just the basic thing. A brief introduction for myself. I am a professor in the College of uh, Dentistry, the University of Baghdad. And it's quite an old university. It's, uh, the college has been around for about 70 years. We have about 1,200 undergraduate students uh, and around 300 uh, postgraduate students. I also have a private practice, which has been there for 25 years. And uh, the, uh, I have a large team and we're exclusive to orthodontics. I'm also the president of the Iraqi Orthodontic Society for the past three years, and we have some scientific events going on. And lastly, I'd like to tell you that I have uh, under my name, a YouTube channel with a, about 7,000 subscribers. And I've got a lot of uh, orthodontic teaching videos. Some of them are mine. Some of them are kind contributions from others. And I've made them as playlists, as bracket prescription, orthodontic biomechanics, etc. And you'll find this lecture also being posted on the same website if you wanted to see it later. You can go to WebEx, uh, also a new uh, website on YouTube. They'll also post it there. And I hope to receive any questions in the comments and I'd be happy to answer them. Now, starting with the topic of the day. The expansion is the uh, uh, expansion. Why, why do we do expansion? We generally do expansion because we're correcting crossbites, but sometimes we do it to create space or to prepare people for my functional appliance treatment or pre-surgical treatment, or just for the fashion of widening smiles. But how do we accomplish this? We generally either use removable appliances or fixed type expanders or rapid palatal expanders. Now for the removable types, these are these were so common back in my day when we used to when I was a resident there, but they generally work by dental expansion, generally by tipping. Patient compliance was so important because if the patient didn't wear it for just a day, then he'll get relapse and probably it would be very difficult to go back and wear it again. The procedure is very simple. You just take an impression and send it to the lab and any age could be treated. But that was disadvantages of it. I didn't like it myself. I used to like these quad helix appliances and these are just fixed uh, places with four loops. And that's because uh, although it was still dental, it was still more tipping, but patient compliance was not an issue. Procedure, it wasn't so difficult. You just needed to band and then take the impression. And any age could be treated with a quad helix appliance. So I, I'd favor that. Rapid palatal expanders, on the other hand, usually are half and half dental and skeletal. So they have more skeletal components. They're half and half. They have a little bit of tipping, but they also have a lot of bodily movement but patient, you know, patient compliance is not an issue. He has it in his mouth, but they have to do that at home. They have to open the screw at home. And I've seen patients who just are not able or are not willing to open the screw. And if they don't open the screw, it doesn't work. The procedure isn't difficult, but it's still not easy because you still have to band 
And many times you'll have to band the four and the six, and that makes it a little bit more uh, tedious in work. And for age, you'll have to do this before the ossification of the mid-palatine suture. So that's before the age of 13, let's say. So that's a limitation. There is SARP or surgically assisted rapid palatal expansion. And this is usually reserved for adults. In this case, they would just reflect the flab from the buccal side and cut the buccal bone, separate the nasal, uh, freno, the nasal midline here, the septum, and the lateral wall of the nose, separate the palate, and expand using a regular hyrax from the palate and just expand the arches and suture everything back again. While this is a, a quite nice for uh, surgical cases, but if the case didn't require more surgery than it did, probably it's just so traumatic. And uh, so then the last type is MARPI. MARPI, which is micro implant assisted, it, the good thing about it is that you can, it has also a lot of skeletal component and probably it is the most skeletal component of all the previous types. It has also more bodily movement rather than tipping movement. Patient compliance is still an issue since in MARP you still have to have the patient activating the appliance. And the procedure, well, the procedure is also quite uh, difficult. You'll still have to band it and then do wire bending, send it to the lab, re-cement it, educate the patient, follow the patient up. So the procedure is a little bit more difficult, but it's much easier than doing it surgically. And for the age part, you, you can cross the 13, 14 years barrier because you're in doing such a large force. You can't crack the suture, the mid-palatine suture, in older patients, and some people have reported using it even in patients that are elderly of 50 and 60 years of age. I wouldn't usually do that, but uh, the age limit is more flexible. And the difference between it is, as you know, that the PMARPE, the, the, the force of expansion is generally from the micro implants. So it's at an, a higher level than the hyrax or the rapid palatal expander, or even the SARP, the, the surgically assisted, because all of these, they have this level of force. They're using the force on the level of the teeth, whereas in the MARP, you're going above that. You're going much higher. You're closer to the bones of the, the skull. And hopefully this is going to make it much better in regards of uh, making it a more horizontal type of fracture rather than a pyramidal type, which we'll come to later on. But is this idea new, using micro implants to assist the expansion? Well, going through the literature, you'll find there's various designs of bony expanders that have been around for some time and the, the idea isn't actually new. Uh, there was also, also this TAD first approach in which you had the TADs placed in first and you take an impression and then you do some type of uh, appliance which is assisted by acrylic and this acrylic engages the TADs and it's going to push them away. This has been around for some time. So the idea, the concept isn't really new. But nowadays, these newer designs are emerging, and there's so many designs to look at. But I would summarize, there's these designs that have the regular hyrax, but you have a, a holes with wires with loops, and you put the, your mini implants in the middle like this, and you just open them, and you only have these two tads in the interior part, which are supporting the hyrax. Another type is using these open holes and you would put your screws here. And while it works, I don't like it because it allows for slippage of the appliance more than if it was closed. There are these closed types. You've got two hole type, four hole type, and same two hole, four hole. There are so many manufacturers nowadays and everybody makes them in a way. Everybody has his own twist. There's these four hole types, but notice the large holes here where the tads wouldn't actually be firmly inserted inside. 
there will be a play between the tad and the the hole inside and there is even look at this one there's a double type of uh, marp so that you have two screws to make it stronger and i be believe this would become very useful when you needed more force and probably this is useful when you're dealing with adults and especially male adults because male adults have a very uh, tough bone and the the suture will be so tough that it's difficult to crack open so some people have advocated using two uh, marps two screws okay so how did I come about to mark? When did I learn about it? What's my story? Well, back in two years back, that was early 2019, there was the Arab Orthodontic Congress in Jeddah. And since I'm uh, the president of the Iraqi Orthodontic Society, I went there and I was uh, uh, participating in the, uh, the meeting of the higher council. But I was lucky to meet uh, Professor Peter Nang, and he's a professor and chairman at West Virginia University in USA. He's very interested in MARP and he gave quite an interesting lecture. And that got me curious. I wanted to start using MARP. So I go back home, I open Instagram and I go through various pages and I see these interesting designs and look at this, just four screws and four tads here. And there's this uh, screw in the middle and wow, it opens up the suture. And there's another design. And there, there they are. And they're opening the suture with it. And there's the, this other design. And this design uses acrylic. And still, wow, so nice. And there's this other design, which is so cute and so small and so concise. So it got me thinking, why don't I use it? Because what, what I hated with rapid palatal expanders, the Hyrax ones, was those arms that extended to the sixes and the fours. What they done is when you expand using dental, you don't actually just push these teeth out. You extrude them. And I always get more extrusion of the sixes. And I hated that with the regular rapid palatal expanders. So with this design, I was not putting anything on the sixes it was fine. Then I would get exactly what I wanted. I wanted it to be without any expansion, without any effect, extrusion effect on the sixes. So I received my first case. He's an 18 year old male. He needs orthognathic surgery. He's been sent to me from the surgeon and he asked me, can we expand his maxilla pre-surgically? And I said, why not? And I look at the case, he's got a crossbite on the right side, the left side looks okay, but there's crowding here, a midline shift, some crowding in the lower arch. And I said, well, it's now or never. Why don't I start? Because I think these orthognathic surgery cases, they're the best to treat. So how do I do that? So I bring my regular Hyrax and I twist the wires around and I make the loops like this. And I try to measure it here so that it, the uh, screw of two millimeters thickness would snugly fit, not exactly fit, but as much as possible. So I said, now we're ready. Patient comes in, we put the appliance in, we put the screws in, and he's ready to go. But notice that the loops, they're not exactly tightly fit around the, the tad, but it's close enough. That's as close as you can get using a custom made Hyrax. Okay, so uh, I go to the market and I buy a step down handpiece, which is a one to 20 handpiece. Since my engine goes down to 1,500 RPM, and that's the least in my handpiece, divided by 20, I'm now at about 75 RPMs, which was fair enough since I've used it with regular TADs, it's not too fast and it's controllable. And as you see in the video, it takes a few seconds to screw that screw inside. So I started using it and I inserted the screws and everything was ready. Patient goes and activates it according to the protocol and we come back with a failure. Look at that. Oh, although he's opened it wide, it's very open. But where's this tad? 
it's just totally embedded inside the soft tissue. And this tad has moved and it's failure. And I'm depressed and I hate doing it. I don't like the case. But out of depression comes out studying of the case. I started to study the case. Why did I fail? So I thought deeply and I summarized the things that made this case fail. Firstly, it's just positioned so posteriorly. When I used to use my ra rapid parietal expander, it was a little bit more medially. And why is that important? Because here, the more you go distally, the closer you are to the pterygopalatine sutures and the zygomatic buttress. And these offer resistance to the expansion. If I made it just more anteriorly, it would have been more easier for me. So that's my thought at that time. I thought, well, next time I'll have to make it more interior. Second point, I didn't have any guiding arms. And while I didn't have guiding arms, and these guiding arms were the things that I was really hating because I didn't like the guiding arms. Guiding arms make it dental movement, not skeletal movement. I didn't like guiding arms. But looking at them and comparing this with this, while this is not purely skeletal, there is some dental component from the gui guiding arms, but the guiding arms, they serve you in seating of the, the appliance. And that I found in the clinic, it was so difficult to seat this. First, I couldn't stop the patient from swallowing it. I had to tie it with a, a dental floss and tie it to his premolar just to make sure that he doesn't swallow it. Secondly, positioning these screws was extremely difficult, especially the first two. And actually getting this mark to be horizontal to the intermolar distance and vertical to the axis of the suture was extremely difficult because I didn't have any guiding arms. Positioning the location to the place where I wanted it most, being just medial to the six, wasn't easy at all. And not only that, and what I noticed is that when I started to activate it, failure of just one tad was enough to rotate all the appliance and therefore the game was lost because there's no guiding arms that will prevent rotation of the appliance. So just failure of one just destroyed it. So I learned my lesson, guiding arms are important. Second thing, the tads, the tads, they were not long enough. They were short. My aim was to go through the palatine, the palate, uh, the palate. But now I realize that you need bicortical perforation. You need to go through both cortices of the palate and the nasal floor so that you gain enough retention of the tads. Without this bicortical perforation, you're going to put so much strain on the tad and the tad can bend, or it can just travel through the cortical plate, the, through the cortical bone, and uh, cancellous bone, sorry. And that's why these will fail. You have to have bicortical perforation. And this is what I got. This one was bent, and it's a stainless steel 2.0 2 screw, but still was bent under the huge amount of force that these appliances generate. So the last thing was play. And I, I noticed in the other article, one of the, uh, the publishers, and his name is here, Nutritional Orthodontics, and you notice that they put flowable composite around the TAD. And that was made just to secure the TAD so that it doesn't move. And I didn't do that. So since I didn't do that, I got a little bit more play and probably this also contributed to the failure. Another thing is I started my first patient being an adult male. And I don't advise anyone of you who's listening today to start with an adult male. If you're going to start, then start with a teenager and start with a female. They have softer bone they're much easier to open their sutures than they are for adult males. So don't start with adult males. Go for teenage, 
females. And lastly, laughing at my case, I noticed after cementation that the arrow is actually pointing forward. So the activation of the appliance needed that we come from back to front, opposite to what we usually do with rapid palatal expansion. But as I told you, the absence of the guiding arms, they just confused me and got me flipping it over. And I had to call the patient every day so that I do the expansion myself. First, because it's my first case and I was worrying about it. And second, because it was difficult for the patient to actually do it. So I go back home and after studying all the weaknesses, I come up with a second idea. My next case, 17 year old female, also needing orthognatic surgery. So I'm going to prepare her. And what I've done is use a hyrax. And this time I, I leave the posterior arms and these posterior arms, they're our guiding arms and just bend the anterior two arms and put some screws inside. They're also two millimeter stainless steel screws. And I think they're 12 millimeters long. So that will ensure my bicortical perforation. And this is the patient there. And we start opening the screw. And after opening the screw, the suture opens. And that was a successful case. That was my first case of a 17 year old female who actually uh, passed. And I was so excited going through the uh, causes of success the positioning of the hyrax was more anterior. So this gave less resistance to opening. The guiding arms, they just gave us good location that prevented rotation of the appliance. The tads were long enough. They perforated the heart palate anteriorly where there was more bone and there was no play because if you look at this, this was so squeezed these because there was, they were very snugly fit for the TADS. The patient was a younger female and the arrows were pointing backwards, which made the activation much easier. So the case was a successful case and we managed to do the expansion and correct the malocclusion later on. But having done that, I started to be more curious and go through the literature and read more. And I came across the uh, maxillary skeletal expander by Professor Won Moon. And uh, looking at it, it looks so nice. And now that I was not so bad with uh, these vertical arms, I started to read more about it. And going through it, and I look, there are so many designs of MARPs. And I hear Professor Moon say that uh, not all MARPs are the same. The maxillary skeletal expander is special in a way. It's different than all the other designs of MARPs. Doesn't mean that these MARPs don't work. All of them work, but every one of them is different in a way. So what's the difference? Well, oh, before the, all of them, the similarity of them, all of them open up the suture. All of them leave this uh, radiolucency and there's no bone. And after some weeks you get new bone and the, the centrals just approximate because of the transseptal fibers. They all work the same anteriorly in the central region, but in the posterior part, they're not always the same. In the posterior, the, the maxillary skeletal expander goes posteriorly as much as possible, opposite to what I thought in case two. In case two, I wanted to go mesially but they said, no, you go posteriorly, although it offers more resistance, but this is the way you have to go posteriorly. And the more posterior you are, the closer you are to the pterygo uh, palatine suture, and the closer you are to the zygomatic buttress, because this is the way, area where you're actually trying to expand. With a maxillary skeletal expander, you're trying to expand more facially than you are dentally. You're not going to go through the alveolar dental complex. You want to expand that. So another thing is when you're doing this, see, this is the zygomatic buttress and you're going against that. And going against that and going against the pterygopalatine suture, you'll have to have higher forces. 
And these screws have been made in a way, which we'll come to later, that they will provide higher forces, which are adequate enough to crack this area, at the same time being more horizontal. Also, look at the tight fit of the holes and the screws versus other designs, which are more open. So this tightness of the screws, and that was perfect so that you can translate the forces immediately to the bone. Another thing is that the large screws and the parallelism of these screws is very crucial to the effect that you get on the uh, mint, uh, mint face. And the higher level of the forces, because if you looked at the, the TAD first approach, they were placing the TADs on the lateral wall of the maxilla. That was relatively low. But when you're going with a maxillary skeletal expander or something like that, you're going to the vault of the palate. And that's very high. That's very close to the nose. So you're going very close to the center of rotation of the fracture itself. So this is what they found, that this is going to make more force on the zygomatic and the uh, maxillary uh, complex. So you're going to get more force here on these sutures. And this is going to affect not just the mid-palatine suture, but all the sutures of the mid-face are going to uh, be affected. And uh, recently, an article by Kolak in 2000 found that almost all the cases, the pterygomaxillary, the pterygopalatine suture was fractured because of the maxillary skeletal expander. And this is something that's uh, wonderful because uh, um, uh, th this is wonderful because it shows the power of this maxillary skeletal expander. So uh, this is the case where you use a maxillary skeletal expander. In the ver from the frontal view, you get more of a horizontal expansion rather than a triangular one. It's not a pure horizontal, of course. It has to be pyramidical, but it's more horizontal than in regular uh, rapid palatal expanders. Another thing is in the, when you're looking at the cl occlusal view, you also get more of a horizontal expansion than you do with a rapid palatal expander, which looks look more like a V. And this is what you get before and after and these other references and you can go through them and you can see, I'm not going to go through the details of that because we have very limited time. So continuing with my story, now I'm convinced about going from the maxillary skeletal expander the Iraqi Orthodontic Society holds a, a conference and it's just months after my f second case. And I meet with Dr. Shwan Elias and he gives a wonderful presentation about maxillary transverse deficiency and the mini screw assisted rapid palatal expansion using MSC screws. So I contact him and I tell him, where did you bring them from? And he says, Biomaterials Korea. And that's exactly the company that Dr. Park used. So we collaborate and he manages to bring some for me and very kind of him. And I took two types, the eight millimeter one and the 10 millimeter one. Actually they make a 12 millimeter one, but this is quite difficult to insert inside the palate. So the majority of the cases I'm going to use the eight millimeter one and just a few cases, a 10 millimeter one and starts uh, the search for the um, MSC. The MSCs, there are two types, the older one, the MSC one, and the newer one, the MSC two. The MSC one was just like the Hyrax expander. It used a pin so that you can expand it. And these, each turn was a quarter turn. So that you turn four times to get one full turn. The newer one, the MSC two, it has a, a hexagonal screw in which you would use a wrench like this one. And this one, the wrench is used to open just once. It takes six turns to make a full turn. So that's the difference between them. The MSC one actually opens 0.2 millimeter and the MSC two opens up only 0.133 millimeter. 
This is important to know because during activation, we would open two turns of this one and opposing one turn of this one because this is hexagonal. But is that the only difference? No, this one uses a pin and this one uses a ratchet. Now, why did they do that? They did that because when they used the MSC1 with the pin, in adults, when you needed more force, the pin was being bent. The appliance just couldn't deliver the amount of force. So they used the ratchet because it doesn't bend. This one has a quarter turn. This one has a one sixth turn. And since I told you this one was made for higher forces, they used a 1.8 millimeter tad, not a 1.5 millimeter tad like in the first one. Anyhow, comes in case three, a 21 year old male. And in this case, I look at the patient and the patient uh, requires expansion because of crowding. And I'm going to go with the expanders and I insert the maxillary skeletal expander. Although the case is not a severe case, it's not a surgical case, but I believe if I'm going to use the expander, it's going to give more skeletal expansion than dental expansion. So I open the pack and I have a look at my new MSC eight millimeter uh, maxillary skeletal expander. And what I notice that the, is that these arms, which I was so afraid of because they're going to do the de dental expansion, these arms, they're flexible arms. They're not rigid arms, they're flexible. And that was, wow, these are flexible arms. And, and also, the body of the expander, it's so small. And they gave it with it either 11 or 13 millimeter screws, which are quite long. And the screws, they, they're tightly fit inside the holes. And uh, oh. so this is the body. And these are the screws, they're tight fitting. And they also give you a ratchet to tighten the screws. Because if you noticed in case two, I used a handpiece because my usual screwdriver is just too long. It just doesn't fit. But with this type, you get a small screwdriver, which is by hand, and you get a ratchet like this one. So you would usually get the, uh, the ratchet itself, the, the, this one, and you would get a finger uh, locking device like this. And this is essential to use because if you don't use this, then the patient may swallow it. So you'll have to put it on your finger and then insert this more medially and just push it back all the way till it hits this bar. So it's quite simple, but since it's only one sixth, many times you'll need to do it twice. Sometimes you only need to do it once, but you just teach the patient that way. And it's fairly easy to use provided it doesn't slip. So the, I cemented the appliance inside the patient's mouth. And after putting the appliance inside the patient's mouth, the screws are in. And once after a, two weeks, the patient comes back in again and you find the suture has opened. And wow, this is my second successful case. And these, uh, the, the maxillary skeletal expanders, they actually work. They're so nice. Notice that at that time, I was adopting more of an interior approach. I was still reluctant with going more posteriorly because of my failed case, case one. Later on, I became more comfortable and I started to push this maxillary skeletal expander more posteriorly so that we can get a more mid-facial uh, expansion rather just than just dental expansion or the uh, lower uh, dental alveolar expansion. And this is the before and after. You can see how much this has opened around four millimeters or two millimeters at that time. And you can just expand more and more until you get what you need. In these cases, I would actually go a little bit more expansion than I need to counteract for any uh, relapse. At the same time, in just in case the molars have been tipped mesially, I mean, buccally, 
then they would relapse again to tip lingually. So I would just make it a little bit more, give it more expansion, and then finish off with more expansion, remove the screw, and give it time for it to relapse back in again. So now that I'm confident with case three, and case three went out very well, I started to do more appliances and I started to gather them and I have several cases waiting at the, at the same time. And this time I had three ongoing, so I took a photo for them. And then I started cementing them and this is case four and then five and then six and then seven and so on. So many cases came on and I think today we're there are about 30 till the preparation of these slides for today. And there are about 30 cases of uh, marps. And most of them, as you can see, you would open up the suture first and then place a fixed appliance. Of course, the centrals will close automatically if you leave them. If the patient is just in a hurry, you can assist it with a fixed appliance. But are there no problems with MARPs? Of course, there are problems. I've had patients who have called me on emergency line and telling me that one of the TADs just fell. So uh, since the patient has already opened the uh, appliance in full and the diastema was closed, he took this, uh, this uh, picture by his uh, mobile phone and I told him, just pull it out, take it out. And that's it, it's fine. Another patient comes in and he's lost two screws. And that was also fine because we've already opened up the suture. There's, there's no problem with losing a screw or two. Another case was in here because of the very narrow palate, you can see that the tads are so far away. And I don't think this tad actually gained a, a bicortical engagement. Probably the distal ones did but the mesial ones, I don't think they did. And I was so reluctant by, about this. And I said, I'm going to try. And if I get just a little bit of expansion, then I'm going to go in again and try with another appliance. And the patient walks in and it succeeded. It was, wow, it actually opened up the screw and you can see the vast space here. And we, so this case was all successful. But are all MARP cases successful? No, not all MARPs are successful. Oral hygiene, you can see, is sometimes so poor with some patients, negligible patients, but that's not the issue. More of the issue is the failures you get. And the failures you get is when you're trying to expand the MARP, yet the, mar the suture is not opening. And when the suture doesn't open, the TADs, they just bend more to the buckle, and these arms, they just dip inside the alveolar mucosa. And when you come to remove them, it's so messy. And uh, although I shouldn't scare you, it's not difficult to remove these because usually the, the soft tissue hasn't gathered around the, this. You don't need to actually make an incision and remove it. You just need to remove the screws. And once the screws are out, you just remove the bands and just pull it out and it comes out fairly easily. Removing the screws is an issue, but I usually give anesthesia. I start with the easiest one and leave, leave the most difficult one for later because this one is usually bent and dislodged and mobile. So just by pulling it to the side, it will come out. You can, of course, section the vertical arms if you like, just cut them from the bands. That will make things easier. In problematic cases, sometimes I do that. Most of the cases, I don't need to cut it from here because this one will be so mobile, it will just be pulled out while removing the bands. Which cases are more problematic? Well, most of the cases, they're adult males over 20 years of age. These are the challenging ones. Females are less challenging, but adult males, they're more challenging. So let's go in through the procedure. How do we actually do MARPs? What's the technique? Well, as you do with a rapid palatal expander, you take a, you put the appropriate bands on the sixes, you take an impression, you pour the cast, you do the wire bending, you fix the MARP, you do the, uh, you really take care of the proximity of the appliance, the TAD, the, the, uh, 
the screw itself, the body here with the pallet because you want these screws to go in and you want this to be exactly flush with the uh, pallet. And uh, after doing that, it's, it's advisable to have some clearance between the, uh, the vertical arms and the pallet. Probably at least two millimeters is advisable. And that's because if, if you looked at my failure case, in case you have uh, the suture delayed and didn't open exactly from the beginning, you wouldn't have these vertical arms sinking inside the soft tissue. And lastly, uh, then you do soldering of this uh, appliance. And after soldering the appliance, you would cement it inside the patient's mouth and give anesthesia. Usually I do that from the posterior region since innervation comes from the posterior forward. And you select the mini screws. Usually they would provide you with 11 or 13 millimeter screws. You can choose whichever you like and you would screw them in. You can use the mini screwdriver, but I personally don't like the mini screwdriver. And you can use the handpiece like this one and just screw it in immediately. But I still don't do that anymore. I don't like to finish off with the handpiece because when you're finishing off with the handpiece, you have no tactile sensation of the bicortical engagement. I have no idea if I had bicortical engagement. So nowadays, I, I prefer to do the ratchet like this one. But even with the ratchet, it's so lengthy if you do it in full. So what I usually do is, of course, I would usually put contralateral ones, do one here, do one here, then this one, then this one not to put in so much strain by doing neighboring ones. But what I usually do is I would usually use the handpiece and drive in the screws midway. And now that they've gone in midway, then I would use the ratchet wrench and finish off the thing to the end. And how you know you reached the end is when you feel that there's such torsion that you are going in to the second cortical plate of the nasal cavity. Sometimes the patient will feel some pain or tingling sensation as you go through the nasal mucosa. Sometimes they don't. In my experience, most of the cases, they don't feel it. Probably because I give anesthesia. I've heard people who just numb the area with local anesthetic. Probably in there, they're, they're going to sense it. But the thing is, uh, should we stop? Should we continue as we pierce the nasal mucosa? Well, basically, we're dealing with just piercing the cortical plate. And finite element studies have shown that if you pierce the cortical plate of the nasal cavity, that's enough. You do not need to push the screw all the way up. Just piercing the cortical plate of the nasal cavity is enough. However, if you did manage to push it all the way through and probably even pierce the, the mucosa inside, Usually it doesn't make that big damage at all. It's just like putting the TAD from the, from the intraoral side. From the intraoral side, you're piercing the mucosa. From the nasal side, you're piercing the mucosa. It's not a big deal. I've not had any patient of mine ever complain about it. So it's nothing to be scared about. And, uh, but it is important that you make them bicortical and you can stop immediately after you sense that you're going through the nasal cavity. But these screws, they are self-limiting. If you just keep screwing, 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 they're going to go inside the hub and they will go flush so that you cannot keep screwing them in. And this is very important to ensure that you do not keep screwing in and destroying the bone. You should, it's preferable to use a CBCT so that you can measure the distance from the mark to the, uh, the nasal mucosa, the nasal floor, so that you can determine are you going to use an 11 millimeter screw or a 13 millimeter screw? That would be useful. And it's important to try to make them as parallel as possible. And this usually is quite, usually it's done by these guiding holes. Since the maxillary skeletal expander has a guiding hole, 
that is very snug and very tight to these screws, they usually go parallel and they don't allow you to do any major uh, tipping of the screws while inserting them. But cleaning them is also an issue. After I finish the insertion, I would usually advise the patient to clean them very well, brushing them, mouth rinsing, probably even having the aid of some other person in the family cleaning them for them is not a bad idea. But a better approach would be to use these water flossers and just try to clean them with water flossing. As you can see, just by water flossing it, it became so clean. So I always advise my patients to use these water flossers. And uh, I advise the patient to use this ratchet and I instruct them to do that. I also give them a video of this and send it to them uh, to their uh, WhatsApp number so that the patient can just have this as a reference. Because so many patients, they would push it in and then reverse back before they pull it out. This does nothing if you push it back and then push it back uh, immediately again. You've done nothing. You should just push it back and pull it out. So giving the patient the, uh, uh, the video helps quite uh, commonly. It's very helpful so that the patient can have it as a point of reference. So how many uh, turns do we need? If you notice, the amount of turns will depend generally. I've summarized this from uh, the brochure of the, uh, uh, the company itself, and it depends on the age. The older you are, the more you need to put force on the uh, expander. You, the more you need to put force on the uh, pallet so that it can crack open. So if you have early teens, you'll need one turn. If you have late teens, that's also, oh, this is one turn every other day. This one, late teens, is one turn every day. Early to mid-20s, two to three turns every day. Older patients, more than two to three turns every day. And all of them unite in one thing. Once you have the diastema appearing, then you can slow down. You can go at a pace of one turn per day. That's fine. But if you look, this is MSC1, which is a quarter turn. What about MSC2, which is a, a, th a sixth of a turn? What happens here is that you got about double the amount of activation because it's half the amount of rotation. So with an MSC2, you've got one turn per day for early teens, two turns, late teens, four to six turns for early to mid 20s and four to six, more than four to six turns for older adults. And once you have the diastema open, you stick to two turns per day. But the thing is, once you have this regimen, concentrate that uh, the, uh, the younger the patient, and especially if she's a female, then they don't require a lot of pressure. The older the patient and the more, uh, and male patients, they require more turns coming up to six turns per day. That's 0.8 millimeters per day because they need a lot of force. And if you put little amount of force, it's not going to do the job. Being gentle with older adults is always the source of failure, which I learned the difficult way because I used to treat the twenties and I would treat them as their late teens and just give them two turns per day and they always come back failed. Because when you put the TADS inside, you have this primary stability, which only lasts for a week or two, and you have to use that. If you don't use that and you go slow, then you lose the primary stability, and you need more force. By the time the force builds up from your slow expansion, you've lost your primary stability, and your TADS migrate. So it's not a good choice. If you're using it for adults, you need to have more turns. If you're using it for teenagers, then you can go slow and go mild with less turns. It's fine. Okay. So what's the procedure? And this is a patient which has uh, been inserted. And as you can see, the, it's expanded. Once it's expanded, I usually place fixed appliances. 
and start to close up what has remained. Many cases, I would find there's a little bit of an open bite interiorly due to change of the intercuspation of the posterior teeth. I don't think there's a lot of extrusion going on on the sixes since they are flexible arms, but probably there's a little bit of extrusion, but the change in the occlusal intercuspation does open the bite a little bit more. You would need some settling elastic to settle this in. And lastly, once you've finished with everything, then you can just lock it down and you'll, you can use a, a wire to screw it in. Or and once you've done that, you can cut off the, the labial arms and just remove the bands and put some uh, bondable tubes. This is especially useful if in like in this case, you have a rotated molar, which you want to derotate this molar. Having this band on it would cannot uh, at all make you derotate it and settle it down. So you'll just have to cut these arms off. I myself, I'm in no hurry to cut the arms off. I'd rather wait for no less than three months to cut the months of the arms off and no less than six arms to actually remove the maxillary skeletal expander. If I can leave it non-problematic for a year, I would do that. Just being on the safe side and trying to minimize as much as possible any uh, relapse. Locking it can be done with a wire or can be done with just flowable composite being placed on the sides here. I prefer to use flowable composite and uh, I can see it and it's more secure than the other type. But we have a problem. Many cases have narrow palates and they're very severely narrow palates. And in these cases, when you have narrow palates where you just can't seat the, uh, the screw inside, and you can see there's a huge space between here and here. If you're going to put your TAD from here to here and go through the mucosa and go through, first, it has to be so long. It has to be probably two centimeters long. Second, it's not going to be efficient because of the fulcrum, the length, the length of this fulcrum is so huge. So it's not going to be efficient at all. One tip is you can trim the cast, just trim it from here, just trim, 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 cut, let's say a millimeter or two cut from the, the mucosa and push it down a little bit. Now you may be thinking, oh, that's going to cause trauma to the soft tissue. How can you trim from the cast and push it down? Why would you cause trauma to the soft tissue? You, you said you shouldn't cause any trauma. Right, I said don't cause any trauma to the soft tissue. But usually if you take this impression out of alginate material and with a stock tray, this material, the, the area here from here to here is going to be quite lengthy. And alginate usually shrinks a little bit. And as it shrinks a little bit, the cast will not resemble exactly the intraoral. So what happens if you cut, let's say a millimeter from here, I'm not saying you cut it so that you can push this all the way down. No, 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 no. Don't misunderstand me. No. Just in say, cases where you need a little bit amount of trimming, you can trim it a millimeter from each side or probably two millimeters from either side. And once you seat that inside the patient's mouth, usually I do not get any trauma. I get this, this arm flushly touching the, the palatal mucosa. So that helps. Notice that in this case, the vertical arms are almost touching the palate. And that was an older case. I wouldn't do that anymore. I'd rather make it about two millimeters away. And then it goes to the band, especially if he's a male adult, because I would believe that the opening of the suture is going to be delayed and takes time. Okay, so another design which I came to favor lately. In these cases, when the, there's such a narrow palate that I cannot use, why not go to the design of case two again? It works. And what, what happens is I would use my regular hyrax and also bend the mesial arms and put some screws inside. And I've used these with older people and they still work. But remember, the fulcrum is interior. You get more interior the expansion than you get of posterior expansion. Okay, but they still work. 
Another idea I've seen is they cut the mesial arms off so that these mesial arms, once, once they're cut off, they may be less interfering. There are newer designs which I've seen in the net and uh, uh, you can go through them and you've seen where they would push down the, uh, these arms and as they push them down, you can get more seating inside narrow uh, pallets. Another design which a friend sent me very recently, which is this new design, which has these vertical rods that go down as you, as you use them. And uh, notice that the pin here, they're using the same pin, but look at the pin. It's reinforced so that it doesn't bend. And look at this one. This one's also taken from Instagram, from Orthodontic World. And it's the same thing. These are vertical arms. They go up and down. So you can bend them or they can push them down all the way so that they engage this narrow palate. And he has also cunningly cut off the, the uh, arms so that he rounded them so that you can go as much close as possible to the palate. There are also modifications that you can make to the, uh, uh, the modifications here to the marps. And one of them, which I'd like to start with, is the uh, use of the marp itself. You can use the marp itself again. I'm not saying recycle them. No, I wouldn't recycle them because they go under a huge amount of force. And I don't guarantee that they're going to uh, be the same. So I wouldn't recycle marps. But what I would do is probably take it apart. And now I have two pieces, this, the three pieces, this piece and this piece and this piece. And when I take these parts off, then I can use these two pieces here, these, these two, which came with the band, just cut the band off. And now you have these two pieces and you can screw them with this, uh, the screws and you can place them wherever you like and just put some force on them, whether you like to retract teeth, uh, push them lingually, intrude, uh, mesialize. You can do anything with them. And this is the good thing. Now, if you use a case and uh, for every case, you have two pieces of these. And these two pieces, they can work beautifully uh, to do anything else. And the good thing is that these are more stable than using just one TAD. And these uh, TADs, they're more in the paramedial area and not here in the area where the greater palatine artery runs. So they're in a safe place and at the same time, very stable. And you can be very creative with whatever design you like. There are issues where people have gone with cortical punctures and they would puncture the uh, palate here also taken from Instagram from another source here that you have the reference and, and you would punch in the, the uh, area here with burrs and it's supposed to make the suture weaker. I've heard people finding success with it in adults. I've heard people who have had failures with it. So uh, I'm no advocate, but I'm just highlighting the area. I've, ha I've also seen places, uh, designs like these, where these are 3D printed metal bands and they would be 3D printed in the lab. That's also some modification. There are modifications where you would cement them on premolars rather than on molars, if you have any problem with molars. There are modifications in which you would not use a band at all. Since you mainly rely on the screws themselves, it is possible that you do not use a band at all and just put some composite and screw, uh, glue them to the teeth. You can also unilaterally distalize molars using these. You can bilaterally distalize molars. And as I, you can see, there's a wide variety of things that you can do with palatal expanders. And it, the, the, it's so open. And one of my favorite is using class three treatment. Uh, in, in accommodation with the reverse headgear, because when you're using reverse headgear, usually you get these molars coming forward. But if you're going to open the, the screw, the, the uh, mid-palatine suture, what happens is that the maxilla comes a little bit forward. This greatly helps treating class three patients. 
it's the probably one of the best things in maxillary skeletal expanders is that they're more designed for class three patients than they are for just crossbite crowding or class two patients. They're much better in class three patients. As you open this wide laterally, you get the maxilla moving a little bit forward and rotating downward. So I've seen this also a uh, case where they would use fiber optic uh, glass, I think here, and they would just put these on and make a bite plane and make these hooks and you can attach them to reverse headgear, which should greatly help pull this in the future. I haven't used it myself, but I do look forward to it since I do have several cases which are class three and they're post the age where I would usually use a reverse headgear. But if I was going to combine it with a MARP, I'm very anxious to do that. I've also seen the last case where we would use a MARP with uh, screws in the mandible here as well. And that looks promising as well. I don't know if these actually work. The MARP usually works fine, but in my private practice, I've used screw on the top to a screw in the bottom and I've used class three elastics. They haven't been so successful, but if you're going to use a MARP and you're, you are going to loosen all the sutures and crack all the sutures, uh, I think it's going to work much better. And this is just the class three elastics and how they work. And the last thing, my take home message is rapid palatal expanders are a real thing and they can be done in late teens and adults by using uh, MARPIs. So I would really encourage you to try them. Uh, go slowly, try to use uh, MSCs, try to use them on teenage females first. And just as the learning curve goes up, then you start to use them on adults more. And thank you for your listening. That brings us to the end of the lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Park, for the invitation. Thank you so much. It was a great time to host your great webinar. Uh, it was really meaningful time for us to.